and she's briefed a lot of local law enforcement on the red-green access that is threatening domestic um, tranquility across the country. Today she'll be discussing civilization jihad. So please join me in welcoming Claire Lopez. Did I take your water? Thank you, Ginny, and hello, CPAC. It's great to be here. I'm going to start with something that might surprise you a little bit. We are not fighting terrorism. We are fighting the forces of Islamic Jihad and Sharia to live free of Islamic law, Sharia. We fight to defend the first things principles enshrined in our foundational documents, the Declaration, the Constitution, Bill of Rights. What are first things principles? Individual liberty, equality of all, in human dignity and before the law, government by consent of the governed, under rule of man-made law. These things are anathema and even blasphemy to those forces of jihad and sharia coming against us. Now you probably have noticed, how could we all not notice, the acceleration in the rate of violent Islamic terror attacks around the world, especially in Western Europe and here at home in the United States. But the main line of effort here in the United States is the civilization jihad for which the Muslim Brotherhood is the vanguard. What does the Muslim Brotherhood do? How does it pursue that agenda? Through taking aim at the pillars of support of our society, academia, the Muslim Student Association, first Muslim Brotherhood front group founded in the United States, 1963. It is now on campuses all across the country, including in high schools and even in middle schools. It is also not just here. It is up all the way into Canada, where the Muslim Brotherhood also is mounting an offense. Our friends up there are in trouble right now. Our Canadian friends need our help and support. They have a bill pending before their parliament in Ottawa that would condemn and even criminalize Islamophobia. <laughs> Pillars of support, our courts and our legal system. The Center for Security Policy has produced two reports about the incidents of Sharia in U.S. courts already. Faith communities, interfaith dialogue, where the bridge only goes one way, towards Islam. Our government and national security, which are so deeply impenetrated by the Muslim Brotherhood. Local law enforcement, and this is a really important one. The Muslim Brotherhood and some of its front groups are actually training our local police and sheriff's departments. And some of those police and sheriff's departments are turning around and training local Muslim Brotherhood front groups. How's that going to work out? Media, society in general, the workplace, all of these I consider, to, I would call these the pillars of support of American society. These are how the Muslim Brotherhood insinuates Sharia gradually stealthily into our society. So what can we do about this? It is an insurgency, and an insurgency is won or lost at the local level, and so will be this one. At the local level, it is all of us. It is we, the people. It is our faith community leaders. It is our local law enforcement that must stand against the insurgency. We can do this at an informed, engaged, and patriotic citizenry, like all of us here today, 
is the very best defense to keep America as great as the Founding Fathers ever envisioned it to be. Thank you. Our Thank next you. and our last speaker is Maureen Olhausen. She is the acting chairman of the FTC. Of course, there's only two members of the FTC right now out of five. But she has been a, a, appointed by President Trump as the acting chairman of the FTC. She joins us uh, she, from the FTC, where they are the people watching out for consumer protection and privacy and intellectual uh, property rights. And she has been at the FTC for a lot of her professional career, and she's also been a clerk at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit for a great friend and a great judge, uh, David Sintel. Please join me in welcoming Maureen Olhausen. Okay. Well, th thank you, Ginny. I'm delighted to be here. This is actually my third time at CPAC, so it's very exciting. Uh, what, what a year, what a lot of energy uh, that we're seeing this year. So I'm here to talk to you about something that may sound a little bit dry compared to what my co-panelists have been talking about, but it's no less important to the strength of the US, and that is intellectual property rights. So as conservatives, we are believers in the value of, intele uh, the value of property rights. And intellectual property rights have the same kind of uh, impact and importance in our economy and in our society as do protections of physical property rights. And what you may not recall is that intellectual property rights are actually mentioned and protected in the Constitution. And so one of my concerns that I've seen d during my time uh, at the Federal Trade Commission uh, during the Obama administration has been this idea that, well, maybe intellectual property rights uh, or property rights in general really should be sort of devalued. Maybe we should allow people to say, well, we would like to use those too, and it's not fair for the inventor or, or fair for the property owner to say, well, you know, you, you need my permission to, to use that. And oftentimes people said to me, well, your belief in property rights is just faith-based, right? There's no, there's no evidence that property rights do the things that you, you believe that they do to support innovation, to support uh, competition and economic growth in the US. So I said, hmm, I bet there's some evidence out there. And I actually did a very comprehensive study and looked at all the evidence that I could find about the connection between intellectual property rights, the protection of them, and innovation as measured by investment in R&D. And I found there was ample evidence showing the important connection between protecting intellectual property rights and allowing innovation to, to flourish and competition to grow in the US. Now you may say, well, OK, that's all well and good, but what, what does that really mean? Uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work at the Federal Trade Commission. Well, one of my big concerns is that this push to devalue uh, intellectual property rights in the U.S. has had an impact on our economy here in the U.S. The willingness of people to invest in new ventures and to, uh, to come up with new ideas and to popularize them, and that's bad enough in the U.S. But the problem is this has encouraged regimes around the world who want to take American intellectual property without proper payment. And they feel empowered by what they've seen in the US, uh, what we've been doing here to say property, it looks pretty good. We want to use it, but we don't want to pay for it. Or we only want to pay a, a, an amount that's good for our businesses uh, around the world. And this is particularly a problem in regimes like China, where they do a lot of manufacturing, but they don't necessarily do a lot of inventing. So they, they want to use our, our property rights without the proper payment. So I'm here today to encourage people to pay attention to intellectual property and the, the, the protection of it. Uh, one other thing Ginny mentioned is that the Federal Trade Commission, we are also charged with protecting consumers, and particularly consumers' data. And I don't know uh, about you, but I was a victim of the OPM data breach. So my data, which I had surrendered to the government as a government employee, and the data of people who had provided references for me were breached and went out to, uh, to a foreign power. And it's being used for who knows what purpose. So at the Federal Trade Commission, we have focused on encouraging entities, government, particularly private entities, to safeguard American consumers' data. Because when we talk about being under attack, 
our companies and our uh, information in the U.S. is under constant attack from around the world of uh, bad actors who want to get that data and they want to use it in a way that can hurt Americans, hurt American consumers. So that's one thing we've been doing at the Federal Trade Commission is encouraging companies and requiring companies to take steps to protect your data against these threats that are occurring around the world. So thank you for listening and I look forward to continuing this good fight. Thank you very much, Maureen. We're certainly glad that you're in, you're in the government and you're watching out for us. I should have given you your other assignment for watching Maureen Olhausen is at M-O-H-L Hausen, H-A-U-S-E-N, F-T-C. So you can find her on Twitter and follow her. And we're almost out of time, so I want to ask our panelists if they have any last minute action items or resources that they want to share with all these citizen activists. Get in the fight, ladies and gentlemen. Get in the fight. We cannot sit on our hands. It's going to be a fight all the way. It's going to be a fight every day. I'm up for it. Are you? Claire? I I can't say it any better than the sheriff just said it, but if you would like to take a look at uh, the Center for Security Policy.org or SecureFreedom.org, you will find a lot of resources on the subjects that I talked about today. Thank you so much for being here. Trevor? Yeah, um, look, I, I don't hate to push my own barrow, but I've got a movie out now called The Enemies Within. Go to enemieswithinmovie.com. It details the huge penetration of your Congress and Senate by radical, hardcore anti-American elements. Uh, we say there's at least a hundred of them that couldn't pass an FBI background check to drive a school bus. And Claire's in the movie. She does a great job. So, but in the fight, this isn't just America that, that, that's at stake here, folks. This is the whole Western world. I don't want to put a responsibility trip on you, but it all depends on you, okay? <laughs> Maureen. No pressure. Uh, and many of the resources that I, were talk I was talking about are on my speech page at ftc.gov. Uh, and the resources to protect your data and to, for companies and for individuals how to take steps to protect their data are also on that website. Let me just say all, all, to all of you listening, if you're interested in this subject, there will be part two of When Did World War III Begin with the Foreign Threats tomorrow at 8.30, same in the morning, same place, and Gordon Chang will be moderating. Thank you for your time, and thank you for protecting liberty. We will stand up to trade cheating anywhere and everywhere it threatens the American job.
Well, good afternoon. Thank you for that very warm, work, warm welcome. We love you. I, well, I love you. I love the energy and enthusiasm that CPAC brings. So I'm Betsy DeVos. You may have heard some of the wonderful things the mainstream media has called me lately. I, however, pride myself on being called a mother, a grandmother, a life partner of 38 years tomorrow, and, and perhaps the first person to tell Bernie Sanders to his face that there's no such thing as a free lunch. The media has had its fun with me, and that's OK. My job isn't to win a popularity contest with the media or the education establishment here in Washington. My job as Secretary of Education is to make education work for students. But today, today we know the system is failing too many kids. How do we know that? Our nation's test scores have flatlined. 1.3 million children drop out of school every year. And because the previous administration spent $7 billion of your dollars on school improvement grants, thinking they could demonstrate that money alone would solve the problem. Yet their own report, issued as they walked out the door, showed that it had zero impact on student outcomes and performance. They tested their model and it failed miserably. Now this is not an indictment of teachers. We all know great public school teachers. My mom was one. Good teachers make a real difference. Good teachers deserve to be honored and compensated accordingly. But the education establishment has been blocking the doorway to reforms, fixes, and improvements for a generation. This is not a left or a right issue. This is an American issue. We need education to work for every child. So let me ask you, do you believe parents should be able to choose the best school for their child regardless of their zip code or family income? Yeah. Me too, and so does President Trump. We have a unique window of opportunity to make school choice a reality for millions of families. Both the President and I believe that providing an equal opportunity for a quality education is an imperative that all students deserve. So now let me ask you, how many of you are college students? Well, the fight against the education ex establishment extends to you too. The faculty, from adjunct professors to deans, tell you what to do, what to say, and more ominously, what to think. They say that if you voted for Donald Trump, you're a threat to the university community. But the real threat is silencing the First Amendment rights of people with whom you disagree. As Secretary, I don't think the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. should have more power over your decisions than you do. I took this job because I want to return power in education back to where it belongs, with parents, communities, and states. We can do this, but only with your help. Defenders of the status quo will stop at nothing to protect their special interests and their special gig. So we need you to engage, to be loud, and to never stop fighting for what we believe. We need you to call, write, email, tweet, and snap every politician who thinks the status quo is OK and that they know better than you when it comes to your, ed your education. Together, we can make American education great again. The next generation deserves no less. Thank you, and I look forward to fighting alongside of you. Thanks. Madam Secretary, it's so great to be here with you. It's great to be with you, now, Kaylee. Now, cheer you guys if you could not be more excited about President Trump's pick for Secretary of Education. <laughs> uh, you, are, you are a phenomenal pick. 
and you've spent 30 years working on these issues that are so important. Children, protecting our future, protecting children of all races, of all identities is crucial, and you are doing that, and you have a history of doing that, and I, I couldn't be more excited for what you have planned for the department. Thank you. And it's an honor. It is. Uh, and on that note, you know, a lot of news has been made in the last 24 hours. President Trump rescinded the Obama guidelines on transgender, and, and, and let's be very clear why, why he did that. President Obama acted lawlessly. He promised us that he would use his pen and his phone to circumvent Congress. He did so repeatedly, including with these guidelines that reinterpreted federal statute. So you put out a letter afterwards basically saying that you want to protect all children, all students. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to clarify what you meant and, and state what you meant in, in the ethos of that letter. Sure. Thank you, Keely. Well, I think the statement uh, spoke to it for itself and to a large extent. But um, let me just say that this issue was a very huge example of the Obama administration's overreach to suggest a one-size-fits-all federal government approach, top-down approach to issues that are best dealt with and solved at a personal level and a local level. And I have made clear from the moment I've been in this job that it's our it's our job to protect students and to do that to the fullest extent that we can. And also to provide students, parents, and teachers with more flexibility around how education is delivered and how education is experienced. And to pr protect and preserve personal freedoms. Absolutely. And on that note, you know, talking about the states and empowering the parents, you know, we as conservatives in this room fully believe that the states are the appropriate, robust actors in the field of education. We want parents to be empowered, and part of that is empowering the states. So with that said, what is the role of the federal government in the Department of Education vis-a-vis -vis the states? Well, the Department of Education has, in the past several years, played a very integral role, I would argue in many ways too much of a role. With the new implement, Im, implementation of the new ESSA rules and, and, and law, uh, we will see a lot of that power return to the states and a lot of the flexibility given to the states to do what they can do best on behalf of students. I think that's the right direction. I think the, the role of the federal government should be as light a touch as possible. Um, and, and the areas in which the Department of Education has an important role are really around the spe needs of special needs students and around um, some of the civil rights issues that we've, we've referenced earlier. Undoubtedly. And you know, one of the things I love just in communicating with you and your staff, um, I really get a sense that you want to unify the country and make real change. And I, I think there's even evidence of that. You know, we're at this time where the country is so divided and there's so much anger and so much disrespect for one another that we need people to come together on behalf of children in particular in your case. And, and the evidence I, I saw of that in speaking with your staff was on day two, you picked up the phone and you made a call to the teachers union, to the ATF, to Randy uh, Weingartner, and you did this despite the fact that the other teachers union, the NEA, put out a statement saying, we refuse to have a relationship with Secretary DeVos. So you have one teachers union kind of increasing division and another one because you reached out and extended a hand, reaching back and extending a hand back to you. And, and I, I believe you're going on a tour of local schools with with Randy. Well, I had a great conversation with Randy, and I think it's imperative that we work together to find common ground. If, uh, if students represent 100% of our future, we need to be focused around what's right for them and doing what's right for them. My conversation with Randy was great, and um, we've agreed to visit schools together. I will visit a, a school that she selects, a traditional public school, and she will visit a, a, a choice school. So I look forward to that opportunity. That's fantastic. And, and you know, another place where this opposition and kind of divisiveness was showcased was during your confirmation hearings. Uh, I, I was myself appalled at the way Senator Warren conducted herself in her line of questioning. Uh, but by contrast, you had Senator uh, Scott, who, who told a beautiful story of how you grew up and how your family mortgaged everything they had to start a business. And you painted a cinder block building and worked on an assembly line. And I think it's such an empowering story. And I wonder if you'd share a little bit of that, because you are the American dream. And, and a lot of students out there are trying to achieve the same thing your family achieved. Oh, sure. Um, yes, my dad was a, a great entrepreneur and inventor. And um, 
I recall well as a young child, about seven or eight years old, painting the first building with him as he put up a cement block building with his first factory that was um, a, a result of mortgaging everything. And um, I worked uh, through different summers, summer jobs at the, the plant, third shift on the visor plant. So he invented um, the lighted sun visor for automobiles. So anybody who enjoys those, uh, <laughs> you can thank my dad for that great invention. Um, I think it was at the urging of my mom. At, she'd like to be able to see to put lipstick on while they were going somewhere <laughs> at night. But yes, it was, it was, a, it was a really important um, experience for me to grow up in a home where everybody pitched in and, um, and where my, my parents really modeled what it was to pursue the American dream in a really meaningful way. Absolutely, that, that's a great story. Uh, and turning in another page, because I heard you ask the audience who in here are college students, and I heard a lot of cheers. Um, something that's really important to students, conservative students in particular, you know, I'm a recent law school graduate, so um, I, I can empathize with the students out there, is um, academic freedom. Because a lot of times on college campuses, you feel that you speak at your own risk if you speak conservative thought. You are oftentimes bullied by your peers and um, sometimes even your professors and your educators. So what advice would you have to students out there who desperately want to share conservatism but feel bullied in doing so? Well, I think my first advice would be don't shut up. Keep talking, keep making your arguments. Um, you, you can do so um, respectfully and with civility, but I think you would need to do so with confidence. We need to have opposing viewpoints and differing ideas in, in, uh, in an academic environment and in any environment where ideas are, are necessary to be exchanged. And I just urge and encourage all of the college students here, or any student, to continue to bring um, your ideas and your viewpoints. That's the, the best way to learn, and it's the best way for us all to learn how to get along together as well. Absolutely. And one of the things that I, I loved about you when, when you were President Trump's pick is the work that you have done on behalf of children in poverty. You helped 400,000 families in poverty uh, and assisted them and gave them school choice and assisted in their educational pursuit. And that, that's fantastic. And that is a, a absolutely indispensable part of you know, President Trump's agenda ahead is helping students in inner cities. So what is your plan at the Department of Education to help children in poverty? Well, we know that education is the great equalizer and it's the real um, moment of opportunity for every student. And so the notion that um, I can choose where my children go to school because I can afford to pay for it but um, my fellow Americans can't because they don't have the same economic means is just, it's not right, it's unjust. And um, I, I, I share the president's view that we must and can do better for all Americans to provide each of them with an equal opportunity to a great education. And we will be working together to advance that um, in, during his administration. That's great. Well, this nation is so blessed to have you as Secretary of Education, and President Trump could not have made a better choice. I'm just so thrilled for your vision. I'm so excited. CRTV is about constitutionalism. And clear completely today at 3.30 p.m. If you leave the ballroom after 2 p.m., you will not be granted re-entry to the ballroom and will need to return through full security and magnetometers. If you attend the breakouts, which begin at 3.30 p.m., you will receive a fast pass to return to tonight's programming. All attendees returning to tonight's programming will need to go through full security. This is the Potomac Ballroom, and it will reopen at 5 p.m. tonight for this evening's programming. Thank you. The Honorable Rance Reedus and the Honorable Steve Bannon. This panel is moderated by the American Conservative Union's Chairman, the Honorable Max Schlapp.
Right, guys, let's take a seat. <laughs> All right, uh, CPAC is known is known for having important moments, and I think it's safe to say by a full room and just a couple of cameras uh, that this is one of those moments. And I. I think the first thing that would be appropriate after 30 days of running a continual sprint is to thank these two guys for what they've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, on that front, on that front, I also think it's a perfect moment to thank all of you right. for helping us elect what will be one of the greatest presidents that ever served this country. All right. And it's because of your work that he made it happen. And, and it's Matt, been great. I, I want to thank you for finally uh, inviting me to CPAC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no, uh, the, what was the name of the? The, the, the un event? uninvited. The uninvited. <laughs> Yes. I know there are many alumni out here in the audience. I, I, didn't, I didn't like the uninvited. Here's what we, <laughs> we decided noticed. to we do noticed. at CPAC with the uninvited. We decided to say that everybody's a part of our conservative family. That's right. And that's what Donald Trump has done to so many of us around the country politically. And you guys have put together uh, an amazing operation. You know, I know you all know this, but the last time a president came to CPAC in his first year, it was Ronald Reagan. St. Ronald in 1981. And you've put together this, uh, the, uh, the president has put together the most conservative cabinet we've ever seen, according to our CPAC ratings. And I think a few of us are pretty happy about what looks like is going to happen on the Supreme Court, too. So it's, uh... Yeah. Now let me ask you to... I'm looking in the back of the room as well, but... Let me ask you two, uh, we all read. Is, is that the opposition party? Yes, that is. <laughs> Let me ask you two, uh, we read a lot about you two. Um, it's all good. But I bet not all of it's accurate. I bet not all of it's accurate. I bet uh, there are some things that don't get written correctly. Let me ask each one of you, what's the biggest misconception about what's going on in the Donald Trump White House? Uh, well, in regard to us two, I think the biggest mi misconception is everything that you're reading. Um, we, we, ba we, we share an office suite together. Uh, we're basically together from 6.30 in the morning until about 11 o'clock at night. I have a little thing called the war room. He has a fireplace with <laughs> you know, nice sofas. And um, it's, uh, it's actually something that you all have helped build. Uh, which is when you bring together, and what this election showed, and what President Trump showed, and let's not kid ourselves. I mean, I can talk about data and ground game, and Steve can talk about big ideas, but the truth of the matter is, Donald Trump, President Trump, brought together the party and the conservative movement. And I've got to tell you, if the party and the conservative movement are together, similar to Steve and I, it can't be stopped. And President Trump was the one guy, he was the one person, and I can say it after overseeing 16 people kill each other, it, it was Donald Trump that was able to bring this, this party and this movement together. And Steve and I know that, and we live it every day. Our job is to get the agenda of President Trump through the door and on pen and paper. You know, but we've known it since August 15th, and I think if you look at, you know, the opposition party and how they portrayed the campaign, how they portrayed the transition, and now they're, they're portraying the administration, it's always wrong. I mean, on, on the very first day that Kellyanne and I started, we reached out to Ryan, Sean Spicer, yeah. Katie. It's the same team 
that you know every day was grinding away on the campaign, the same team that did the transition. And if you remember, you know, the campaign was the most chaotic, you know, by the media's description, most chaotic, most disorganized, most unprofessional, had no earthly idea what they were doing, and then you saw them all crying and weeping that night on, on, on the 8th when, when and, and, and the reason it worked, the reason it worked is, is, is President Trump. I mean, Trump had those ideas, had that energy, had that vision that could yeah. galvanize a team around him of disparate, look, we're a coalition. You know, a lot of people think, you know, have strong beliefs about different things, but we understand that you can come together to win, and we understood that from August 15th, and, and we never had a doubt, and Donald Trump never had a doubt that he was going to win, and, and I think that that is the power of this movement. And, and on top of that, uh, first of all, President Trump laid out his vision, was it four or five years ago here at CPAC? That's right. And it was that vision. It's nothing different. If you go back and watch the tape, of President Trump four or five years ago. That was the Trump agenda. One of the things I used to say all the time, and Governor Walker and everyone gets sick of me saying it, but I think that President Trump found it, which was what this country, what all of us were starving for the whole time, because we're so sick of politics and politicians, in spite of the fact that we love being here, we, we actually hate politics, but what we were starving for was somebody real somebody genuine, somebody that was actually yeah. who he said he yeah. was. And the, the, the media attacked us on the campaign. Remember, attacked me, oh, you can't spend the money on Trump, go give it to the Senate. Attacked us on the transition. We, President Trump put in the best cabinet in the history of cabinets, right. I think. Now, I feed ridiculous stories, and all we do every day, and all President Trump does every day is hit his agenda every single day. Whether it's TPP, whether it's deregulation, uh, whether it's Neil Gorsuch, whatever it is, his promise is coming through every day. He's even, he's even leaving bathrooms alone. That's kind of a nice, refreshing yeah. thing well, for just, a lot of people as well. We happen to think it's a state <laughs> issue. Of course. But, but I, I think let's go back to that point that, that Ryan's made for a second. Uh, President Trump, when he was running, he made a, and, and this is the other thing that the, 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 the mainstream media or opposition party never caught is that if you want to see the Trump agenda, it's very simple. It, it was all in the speeches. He went around to these rallies, but those speeches had tremendous amount of content in them, right? I happen to believe, and I think many others do, he's probably the greatest public speaker in those large arenas since William Jennings Bryan. This was galvanized. And remember, we didn't have any money. Hillary Clinton, these guys had over $2 billion. We had a couple of hundred million dollars. It was those rallies and those speeches. All he's doing right now is he's laid out an agenda with those speeches, with the promises he made, and our job every day is just to execute on that, is to simply get a path to how those get executed. And he's maniacally focused on that, and I think that's one of the powers of the transition, where many, many people try to come in and try to convince President Trump, hey, you won on this, but this is what you want to do, and he's like, no. I promise the American people this, and this is the plan we're going to execute on. And Ryan said, so, uh, and by the way, that's why you've seen the executive orders, what the Supreme Court, the way he's gone through the Supreme Court, and by the way, the other 102 judges that we're eventually going to pick, it's just a methodical, and that's what the mainstream media won't report. Just like they were dead wrong on the chaos of the campaign, and just like they were dead wrong in the chaos of the transition, they are absolutely dead wrong about what's going on today because we have a team that's just grinding it through on what President Donald Trump promised the American people. And the mainstream media better understand something. All of those promises are going to be uh, implemented. That's awesome. <laughs> it's been a... Uh... You know, Steve, you're a really likable guy. You should do this <laughs> yeah. more often. Uh, not so bad. <laughs> he's yeah. not so bad. Yeah. Most <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, so uh, what are 30 days of action? And you guys have touched on some of that action. Each one of you, tell me the one or two things that have happened in the last 30 days that you think are the most critical. And what is the one thing that you just, like you said, Steve, maniacally focused that has just got to happen early in the administration to really turn this country around. So start first with the first 30 days, and what's that focus after that? So there's a lot that has, that's a happened in the, in the first 30 days. Um, whether, you know, and you look at uh, our, the world, the, the, our world order and, and some of the things that are going on that I think are, will be dealt with soon. But um, the first thing I think is Neil Gorsuch for a couple things. Number one, we're not talking about a change 
over a four-year period. We're talking about a change of potentially 40 years of law, number one. But more important than that, more important than that, it established trust. It established that President Trump is a man of his word. We always knew that. But when he said, here's 20 names on a piece of paper back in July, remember? And he said, I'm going to pick my judge out of these 20 people that are on this piece of paper. And he did it. That's number one. Because Neil Gorsuch represents a conservative, represents the type of judge that has the vision of Donald Trump, and it fulfills the promise that he made to all of you and to all Americans across the country. Second thing, deregulation. What hasn't been talked about a lot is that President Trump signed an order that puts in place a constant deregulatory form within the federal government. And what it says is for every regulation presented for passage, that cabinet secretary has to identify two that that person would eliminate. And that's a big deal. And then lastly, immigration. Immigration, protecting the sovereignty of the United States, putting a wall on the southern border, making sure that criminals are not part of our process. These are all things that 80% of Americans agree with, and these are all things that President Trump is doing within 30 days. Steve. Yeah, I, 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 think that, I think the same thing. I think if you look at the lines of work, I, I kind of break it out into three verticals or three buckets. The first is kind of national security and sovereignty, and that's your intelligence, the Defense right. Department, Homeland Security. The second line of work is what I refer to as economic nationalism, and that is uh, Wilbur Ross at Commerce, Steve Mnuchin at Treasury, Lighthizer at, uh, at Trade, uh, Peter Navarro, Stephen Miller, these people that are rethinking how we're going to re reconstruct the, uh, our trade arrangements around the world. The third, broadly, line of work is what is deconstruction of the administrative state. And if you... So I think, I think, I think the three most important things, I think one of the most pivotal uh, moments in modern American history was his immediate withdrawal from TPP. That got us out of a, got us out of a trade deal and let our sovereignty come back to ourselves. The people, the mainstream media don't get this, but we're already working in consultation with the Hill. People are starting to think through a whole raft of amazing and innovative bilateral relationships, bilateral trading relationships with people that will reposition America in the world as a, as a fair trading nation and start to bring jobs, high value added manufacturing jobs back to the United States of America. On the, on the, uh, on the national security part, it was certainly the first, I think the first two EOs that you've started to see implemented here over the last couple of days under General Kelly, and that is the rule of law is going to exist when you talk about our sovereignty and you talk about immigration. General Kelly and Attorney General uh, Sessions are adamant, you know, that, and you're going to start to see, I think with the defense budget we're going to talk about next week when we bring the budget out, and also with uh, certain things about the, the plan on ISIS and, and what General Mattis and these guys think, I think you'll start to see the other part of that. But the third, this regulation, it, you oh, know, yeah. every business leader we've had in is right. saying not just taxes, but it is, right. uh, it is also the regulation. And I think the consistent, if you look at these cabinet appointees, they were selected for a reason, and that is the deconstruction, the way the progressive left runs, is if they can't get it passed, they're just going to put it in some sort of regulation in, a, uh, in an agency. That's all going to be deconstructed, and I think that that's why this regulatory thing is so important. We had Dr. Larry Arn on the stage earlier today, and he brought up the fact that uh, we're promulgating more laws and regulations than we ever have before, and most of that are from these independent agencies uh, that are just on autopilot, and you guys can stop that. And also coming from the federal bunch, as conservatives, we know that a lot of times we fight out the political wars over issues we care about, and then all of a sudden, liberals on the bench, like a lightning bolt out of the sky, just change things. Right. And so what you guys are saying about changing that order is amazing. You know, we all, we all consume a lot of news. We watch and read a lot of things. There's been a great democratization in news. People get their news now from literally hundreds and thousands of sites. What, what would each of you say, uh, what is the, you know, there's all these polls that are being put out again, is Donald Trump doing a good job, is Donald Trump doing a bad job? I know what you all think, uh, we've been hearing it all, all day. What is it that they keep getting wrong, and do you think it ever gets fixed? What does the media keep getting wrong about this Trump phenomenon and what's happening out there in the country, and is there any hope that this changes? Um, I, I think there's hope that it's going to change. I mean, we, we sit here every day and, 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 and the president pumps out all this uh, work and, and, and the executive orders and, and punching through the promises that he made to the American people. So we're hoping that the media would catch up eventually. But 
we're so conditioned to it. I'm personally so conditioned to hearing about why President Trump isn't going to win the election, why, one contro why a controversy in a primary is going to take down President Trump. I lived through it as chairman of the party. And, and it really hit me because it was maybe the summer of 2015. And you remember the media was constantly pounding President Trump. And the polling kept getting better and better and better for President Trump. But it was when I went home and got out of this town, and I went back to Kenosha, and I talked to my neighbor, and I said, Bob, what do you think? And he goes, man, I really love that Trump. And I said, Sandy, Sandy, what do you think? She says, I'm, we're for Trump. And it was, as you all lived through it too, because you all had different people you were for, but you kept running into your neighbors, and you kept running into people that you know, and what did they kept telling you? They kept telling you, Trump, Trump, Trump. And so, what, <laughs> Trump. So. Tomorrow, tomorrow, okay? Just be patient. <laughs> I knew, and so it was back then, my family and my sister, who's a doctor out in San Diego, and it just kept everyone around me that nothing it was impenetrable. Because it goes back to what I said before, which is that the country was hungry for something far more, far bigger than one story or one off issue. It was something that the people wanted in this country that was real and something that was going to change the direction that we were heading, and it was President Trump, but that was the answer. The reason Reince and I are good partners is that we can disagree. It's not only not going to get better, it's going to get worse every day in the media. <laughs> and here's why. But by the way, the internal logic makes sense. They're corporatist, globalist media that are adamantly opposed, adamantly opposed to an economic nationalist agenda like Donald Trump has. President Trump really laid this out, as Ryan said, many years ago at CPAC. It's really CPAC that have really originally gave him the springboard. It's the first time at Breitbart we started seeing him and see, saw how people, re, you know, his speeches resonated with people. And then he would go out to these smaller uh, town halls later and really he got traction with the same message he's bringing today. Here's, the only re here's why it's going to get worse. Because he's going to continue to press his agenda. And as economic conditions get better, as more jobs get better, they're going to continue to fight. If you think they're going to give you your country back without a fight, you are sadly mistaken. Every day, every day it is going to be a fight. And that is what I'm proud of about Donald Trump. All the opportunities he had to waver off this, all the people have come to him and said, oh, you got to moderate. Every day in the Oval Office, he tells Reince and I, I committed this to the American people. I promised this when I ran, and I'm going to deliver on this. How novel. Yeah. How That's interesting. I remember I was uh, being asked by some reporters, they're like, themselves, you know, uh, classical liberals or conservatives or Reagan conservatives. There are other folks that consider themselves libertarians. There are other folks that are part of this new Trump movement. And Trump brought a lot of new people. There's probably in this people in this crowd that wouldn't have been in this crowd before. So it's, there's a lot of diversity here. We all know it when we're at the bar at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, can, can this Trump movement be combined with what's been happening at CPAC and other conservative movements for 50 years? Can this be brought together? Uh, and, is, and this is going to save the country. Go ahead. Um, well, first of all, it has to, and we have to stick together as a team. Um, I think that what you've got is an incredible opportunity. You've got an incredible opportunity to use this victory that President Trump and all of us and you and everyone that made this happen put together and, and work together and continue to communicate. Um, it's very similar. Some of the, the core principles of President Trump are very similar to those of Ronald Reagan. When you look at peace through strength and building up the military, I mean, how many times have you heard President Trump said, I'm gonna build up the military, I'm gonna take care of the vets, I'm gonna make sure that we don't have a Navy that's decimated and planes that, that are nowhere to be found. Peace through strength, deregulation. Uh, you think about the economy and the economic boom that was created. And some of it is going to take a little time, I mean, to get the jobs back, to get more money in people's pockets. Those things are going to happen. And in the meantime, we have to stick together and make sure that we've got President Trump for eight years, and he's somebody that we know 
that we can, we're going to be very proud of as these things get done. Uh, but it's going to take all of us working together to make it happen. You know, I've, sa I've said that there's a new political order that, that's being formed out of this, and it's still being formed. But if you look at the wide uh, degree of opinions in this room, whether you're a populist, whether you're a limited government conservative, whether you're a libertarian, whether you're an economic nationalist, um, we, we have wide and sometimes divergent opinions. But I think we, the center core of what we believe that we're a nation with an economy, not an economy just in some global marketplace with open borders, but we are a nation with a, a culture and a, uh, and a reason for being. And I think that's what unites us. And I think that that is what's going to unite this movement going forward. President Trump tomorrow is coming, I think, really to express his appreciation. Absolutely. The vice and president's coming The vice tonight. president's coming tonight. And the reason is he understands in CPAC there are many, many, many voices. But he's here to say appreciation and, a whole, and to drive this movement forward. This is really where he got his launch, you know, with his ideas in the conservative Absolutely. movement, what, seven, six uh, years ago, five years ago? And he wanted to show his appreciation. We're at the top of the first inning of this, and it's going to take just as much fight, just as much uh, focus, and just as much determination. And the one thing I'd like to leave you guys today with is that we want you to have our back. But more importantly, We ne By the way, President Trump, we never doubted that for a second, but also, and more importantly, hold us accountable. Hold us accountable to what we promised. Hold us accountable for delivering on what we promised. Let me just ask, as we, uh, as we close this out, it's time for, you know, you guys have been so kind of kumbaya here, it's kind of time for a little bit of a group hug. Uh, let me ask okay, yeah. you, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to do the Bar Barbara Walters thing for those of you who remember <laughs> Barbara Walters. Uh, let me ask you. What do you, you've worked really closely with Steve. Right. Uh, you say your offices, I know what two offices they are, they are really close to each other. Uh, what do you like the most about them? Um, <clears throat> Hold on, let him Wait. think. I, I, love, I love how many collars he wears. Uh, <laughs> interesting look. Um, uh, one thing, we're different, but we're, we're very similar is that I think that he is very dogged in making sure that every day the promises that President Trump has made are the promises that we're working on every day, number one. Number two, um, he's incredibly loyal. And number three, um, which I think is a really important quality as we are working together to, to see to it that President Trump's vision is enacted, is that he's extremely consistent. That as you can imagine, there are many things hitting the president's ear and desk every day. Different things that come to the president that want to move him off of his agenda. And Steve is very consistent and very loyal to the agenda and is a presence that I think is very important to have in the White House. And I consider him, and secondly, and a very dear friend, a very dear friend and someone that, we, that I work with every second of the day, and, and actually we cherish, I cherish his friendship. Yeah, it, you know, I can run a little hot on occasions. Um, <laughs> and and Reince is indefatigable. I mean, it's low key, but it's determination. The thing I respect most, and the only way this thing works, is Reince is always kind of steady. He's got Katie and some other people around him. It's very steady. But his job is by far one of the toughest jobs I've ever seen in my life. To make it run every day, to make the trains, and you only see the surface. What's going on underneath and planning what's three weeks down the road to the, to the degree that we're planning it, of all these EOs and legislation, and you know, whether it's a tax reform bill. Reince is indefatigable. In